Chapter 21 Uba came running into the cave, gesticulating wildly. Mother! Mother! Ayla's back! Isa's face strained. No, it can't be. Is the baby with her? Uba, did you go to see her? Did you tell her? Yes, mother, I saw her. I told her how mad Brun was. I told her not to come back, the girl motioned. Isa hurried to the entrance and saw Ayla walking slowly toward Brun. She crumpled to the ground at his feet, leaning forward over her infant protectively. She's early. She must have misjudged the time, Brun motioned to the magician hurriedly shuffling out of the cave. She didn't misjudge, Brun. She knows it's early. She came back on purpose, Mogur signaled. The leader eyed the old man, wondering how he could be so positive. Then he glanced down at the young woman and back at Mogur a little apprehensively. Are you sure the charms you made to protect us will work? She should still be isolated. Her female curse cannot be over yet. It's always much longer after giving birth. The charms are strong, Brun. Made from the bones of Ursus. You are protected. You may see her, the magician replied. Brun turned back and stared at the young woman huddled over her infant, quaking with fear. I should curse her right now, he thought angrily. But it's not the child's naming day. If Mogor is right, why did she come back early? And with the baby? He must still be alive or she wouldn't have him with her. Her disobedience is unforgivable. But why did she come back early? His curiosity was too much for him. He tapped her on the shoulder. This unworthy woman has been disobedient, Ayla began with the silent formal motions, not looking directly at him and not sure he would respond. She knew she shouldn't be trying to talk to a man. She should be in isolation. But he had tapped her shoulder. This woman would speak to the leader if it were allowed. You don't deserve to speak, woman. But Mogor has invoked protection in your case. If I want you to speak, the spirits will allow it. You are right. You have been very disobedient. What do you have to say for yourself? This woman is grateful. This woman knows the customs of the clan. She should have disposed of the infant as the medicine woman told her. But she ran away. She was going to return on her son's naming day, so the leader would have to accept him into the clan. You return too soon, Brun gestured triumphantly. It is not the naming day yet. I can command the medicine woman to take him from you now. The tension that had knotted Brun's neck since Ayla left relaxed as he made the motions and the full realization hit him. Only if the child lived seven days would tradition force him to accept the baby. The full time had not elapsed. He did not have to take him. He had not lost face. He was in command again. Ayla's arms clutched involuntarily at the baby held to her breast with the cloak. Then she continued. This woman knows it is not yet the naming day. This woman realized it was wrong for her to try to make the leader accept her son. It is not a woman's place to decide if her child should live or die. Only the leader can make that decision. That is why this woman returned. Brun looked at Ayla's earnest face. At least she came to her senses in time, he thought. If you know the customs of the clan, why did you return with a child that is deformed? Isa said you were unable to perform your duty as a mother. Are you ready to give him up now? Do you want the medicine woman to do it for you? Ayla hesitated, hovering over her son. This woman will give him up if the leader commands it. She made the sign slowly, painfully, forcing herself, feeling as though a knife were twisting in her heart. But this woman promised her son she would not let him go alone to the world of the spirits. 
If the leader decides the baby may not live, she asks him to curse her. She slipped out of the formal language and pleaded, I beg you, Brun, I beg you to let my son live. If he has to die, I don't want to live. Ayla's fervent plea surprised the leader. Some women, he knew, wanted to keep their babies in spite of malformations and disfigurements, but most were relieved to dispose of them as quickly and quietly as possible. A deformed child stigmatized the mother. It advertised a certain inadequacy, an inability to produce a perfect baby. It made her less than desirable. Even if the deformity was small enough not to pose a major handicap, there were considerations of status and future mates. A mother's later years could be difficult if her children or her children's mate could not take care of her. Though she would never starve, her life could be miserable. Ayla's request was unprecedented. Mother love was strong, but strong enough to follow her child to the next world? You want to die with a deformed baby? Why? Brun asked. My son is not deformed, Ayla motioned with the barest trace of defiance. He's just different. I'm different. I don't look like people of the clan. My son is too. Any baby I ever have will look like him if my totem is ever defeated again. I'll never have a baby that will be allowed to live. I don't want to live either if all my babies have to die. Brun looked at Mogor. If a woman swallows the spirit of a man's totem, shouldn't the baby look like him? Yes, it should. But don't forget she has a male totem too. Perhaps that's why it fought so hard. The cave lion may have wanted to be part of the new life. There could be something to what she says. I would have to meditate on it. But the child is still deformed. It often happens when a woman's totem refuses to give in completely. It makes her pregnancy difficult and deforms the baby, Magor replied. I'm more surprised the child was male. If a woman's totem puts up a strong fight, it usually makes the child female. But we haven't seen him, Brun. Perhaps we should examine him. Should he bother? Brun wondered. Why not just curse her now and dispose of the baby? Ayla's early return and penitent groveling eased Brun's wounded pride, but he was far from mollified. He had come too close to losing face because of her, and it wasn't the first problem she had caused him. She had returned, but what would she do next? And then there was the clan gathering, as Browd had reminded him so many times. It was one thing to let Isa pick up a strange child and take her into his clan, but Brun had cause to reflect often lately on the impression it would make on the other clans to arrive at the meeting with a woman born to the others. He wondered, looking back, how he had made so many decisions that were so unorthodox. Each one, at the time, didn't seem too unreasonable. Even allowing the woman to hunt was logical then. But added together, and seeing them from an outsider's point of view, the effect was an overwhelming breach of custom. Ayla had been disobedient. She deserved to be punished. And cursing her would eliminate all his worries. But a death curse was a serious threat to the clan, and he had already exposed them once to evil spirits because of her. Her voluntary return had prevented his disgrace. Isa was probably right. She had lost her mind temporarily from the shock and the pain. He did tell Isa he would have considered a request to let the baby live if he had been asked. Well, she did ask. She came back knowing the full extent of her offense, knowing it and willing to face it, begging for the life of her child. He could at least examine the baby. Brun did not like making hasty decisions. 
He gave Ayla an abrupt signal, motioning toward Kreb's hearth, then strode away. Ayla ran into Iza's waiting arms. If nothing else, at least she would see the woman who was the only mother she knew one last time. You've all had a chance to examine him, Brun said. Under normal circumstances, I would not bother you. It would be a simple decision. But I want to know your opinions. A death curse is a strong possibility, and I don't like exposing the clan to evil spirits again. If you find the boy is acceptable, I can hardly curse the mother. Without her, another woman would have to take him. He'd have to live with one of you who's made as a nursing child. If the baby is allowed to live, the punishment for Ayla should be less severe. Tomorrow is the naming day. I need to make the decision soon, and Mogor will need some time to prepare for a curse if that is to be her punishment. It must be done before the sun rises in the morning. It's not only his head, Brun, Krug started. Ika was still nursing her youngest, and Krug had no desire to have Ayla's infant added to his hearth, far-fetched though the possibility was. That's bad enough, but he can't even hold it up. It has to be supported. What will he be like when he's a man? How will he hunt? He'll never be able to provide for himself. He'd only be a burden on the whole clan. Do you think there's any chance his neck will get stronger? Droog asked. If Ayla dies, she will take part of Ona's spirit with her. Aga would take her son. She feels she owes Ayla that much. Though I don't think she really wants a deformed baby. If she's willing, I suppose I would be too. But not if it will burden the whole clan. His neck is so long and scrawny and his head is so big, I don't think it will ever be strong enough. Krug commented. I won't have him at my hearth for any reason. I wouldn't even bother to ask Oga how she feels about it. He's not fit to be a sibling to her sons. It would make him a brother to Brack and Grev. I won't allow that. Brack will survive even if she does take a little piece of his spirit with her. I don't know why you're even considering it, Brun. You were ready to curse her. Just because she came running back a little early, you're ready to take her back. And talking about taking her defective son besides. Brown gestured bitterly. She defied you by running away. Coming back doesn't make her disobedience any less. What's there to discuss? The baby is deformed and she should be cursed. That's the end of it. Why do you always waste our time with these meetings about her? If I were leader, she would have been cursed already. She's disobedient, she's insolent, and she's a bad influence on the other women. How else can you explain Isa's misbehavior? Proud was working himself up to a fury, his gestures becoming more excited. She deserves to be cursed, Brun. How can you think of anything else? Why can't you see it? Are you blind? She's never been any good. If I were leader, she would never have been accepted in the first place. If I were leader... But you're not leader yet, Proud, Brun returned coldly. And you're not likely to be if you can't keep yourself under better control. She's only a woman, Browd. Why do you feel so threatened by her? What can she possibly do to you? She must obey you. She has no choice. If you were leader, if you were leader, is that all you can say? What kind of leader is so anxious to kill a woman that he's willing to jeopardize the whole clan? Brun was on the edge of losing control himself. He had put up with all he could take from the son of his mate. The men were shocked and uneasy. An open battle between the present leader and the future one was distressing. Brown had overstepped his bounds, to be sure, but they were accustomed to his outbursts. It was Brun who caused the dismay. They had never seen the leader so close to losing his control and he had never before openly questioned the qualifications of the son of his mate to follow him as leader. For a tense moment, 
The two men locked eyes in a battle of wills. Browd looked down first. No longer jeopardized by loss of face, Brun was firmly in control again. He was leader and not ready to step down. It put the younger man on his guard. His footing wasn't as secure as he thought. Browd fought down the feeling of impotence and bitter frustration that welled up inside. He still favors her, Browd thought. How can he? I'm the son of his mate. She's just an ugly woman. Browd struggled to remain calm, swallowing the bitterness that rankled his soul. This man regrets he has caused the leader to misunderstand him, Browd motioned formally. This man's concern is for the hunters he must lead one day. If the present leader thinks this man is capable of leading hunters, how can a man hunt if his head wobbles? Brun stared hard and angrily at the young man. There was an inconsistency in the meaning of the formal gestures and the unconscious signals of expression and posture. Browd's overly polite response was sarcastic, and it irritated the leader far more than direct disagreement. Browd was trying to hide his feelings, and Brun knew it. But Brun was feeling shame at his own outburst. He knew it was prompted by Browd's increasingly derogatory remarks that cast doubt on his judgment. They had rubbed a sore spot on his pride. But that was no excuse for losing his own self-control enough to disparage the son of his mate so openly. You've made your point, Browd, Brun signaled stiffly. I realize the baby will grow up to be more a burden to the leader who follows me and the one after, but the decision is still mine. I will do what I think best. I have not said the baby will be accepted, Browd, or that the woman will not be cursed. My concern is for the clan, not her or her child. A death curse can put everyone in danger. Lingering evil spirits can bring bad luck, especially since they've been released before. I think the child is too deformed to live, but Ayla is blind to her baby's affliction. She can't see it. It may be that her strong desire to have a child has affected her mind. When she returned, she begged me to curse her if her son was not acceptable. I asked for your opinions because I wanted to know if anyone else saw something about the infant that I didn't. A death curse to punish her or to grant her request, it is still not a decision to make lightly. Browd's frustration eased. Maybe Brun isn't favoring her after all, he thought. You're right, Brun, he said contritely. A leader should think of the dangers to his clan. This young man is grateful for such a wise leader to instruct him. Brun felt his tension melt. He hadn't seriously considered replacing Browd. Not ever. He was still the son of his mate, the child of his heart. Self-control isn't always easy, Brun thought, remembering his own irritation. Browd just has a little more trouble than most. But he is improving. I'm glad you understand that, Proud. When you are the leader, you will be responsible for the safety and welfare of the clan. Brun's comment not only let Proud know he was still heir apparent, it relieved the rest of the hunters. They wanted the security of knowing that the traditional rightness of the clan hierarchy, and their own place in it, would be maintained. Nothing disturbed them quite so much as uncertainty about the future. It is the welfare of the clan I was thinking about, Browd motioned. I don't want a man in my clan who can't hunt. What good will Ayla's son ever be? Her disobedience does deserve severe punishment. And if she wants to be cursed, it will satisfy her too. We'd be better off without them. Ayla defied clan traditions deliberately. She doesn't deserve to live. Her son is so deformed, he doesn't deserve to live. 
there was a general round of agreement. Brun detected a certain element of insincerity in Browd's reasoned argument, but he let it go. The animosity between them had dissipated, and he didn't want to stir it up again. Open strife with the son of his mate disturbed Brun as much as it did the others. The leader felt he should add his agreement, but something made him hesitate. It is the right thing to do, he thought. She's been a problem from the beginning. Of course Isa will be upset, but I didn't promise to spare either of them. I only said I would consider it. I didn't even say I would look at the baby if she returned. Whoever expected her to return anyway? That's just the problem. I never know what to expect from her. If the grief weakens Isa, well, there's still Uba. After all, she was the one born to the line, and she can get more training from the medicine women at the clan gathering. If the part of Brock's spirit she carries dies with Ayla, is it really so much of him to lose? Browd isn't worried about it. Why should I worry? He's right. She does deserve the severest punishment, doesn't she? Such strong love for a baby isn't even normal. What do old women's tales prove? She can't even see that her son is deformed. She must be out of her mind. Can there be that much pain in giving birth? Men have suffered worse, haven't they? Some have walked all the way back after a painful hunting injury. Of course, she's only a woman. She can't be expected to bear as much pain. I wonder how far she went. The cave she mentioned can't be that far, can it? She nearly died giving birth. She was too weak to travel very far. But why couldn't we find it? Besides, if she's allowed to live, I'll have to take her to the clan gathering. What would the other clans think? It would be worse if I allow her deformed child to live. It's the right thing to do. Everyone thinks so. Maybe there wouldn't be so much of a problem with Browd. Maybe he could control himself better if she wasn't around. He's a fearless hunter. He'd make a good leader if only he had a little more sense of responsibility, just a little more self-control. Maybe I should do it for Browd's sake. For the son of my mate, it might be better if she was gone. It is the right thing to do. Yes, it really is. It's the right thing to do. Isn't it? I have reached my decision, Brun signaled. Tomorrow is the naming day. At first light, before the sun breaks, Brun, Mogur interrupted. He had kept himself out of the discussion. None of them had seen much of him since the birth of Ayla's child. He had spent most of the time in his small annex searching his soul for an explanation of Ayla's actions. He knew how hard she had struggled to accept the ways of the clan, and he thought she had succeeded. He was convinced there was something else, something he hadn't realized that had driven her to such an extreme. Before you commit yourself, Magor would speak. Brun stared at the magician. His expression was enigmatic as usual. Brun had never been able to read Magor's face. What can he say that I have not considered? I've made up my mind to curse her, and he knows it. Magor may speak, he motioned. Ayla has no mate, but I have always provided for her. I am responsible for her. If you will allow it, I would speak as her mate. Speak if you will, Magor, but what can you add? I have already considered her strong love for the child and the pain and suffering she went through to have him. I understand how difficult it may be for Isa. I know it may weaken her too much. I've thought of every possible reason for excusing her actions, but the facts remain. She defied clan customs. Her baby is not acceptable to the men. Browd made it clear neither one deserves to live. Mogur pulled himself up to his feet, then threw his staff aside. Wrapped in his heavy bearskin cloak, the magician was an imposing figure. 
Only the older men and Brun ever knew him as anything but Mogur, the Mogur, the holiest of all the men who interceded with the world of the spirits, the most powerful magician of the clan. When moved to eloquence during a ceremony, he was a charismatic, awe-inspiring protector. It was he who braved the invisible forces far more fearsome than any charging animal, forces that could turn the bravest hunter into a quaking coward. There was not a man present who did not feel more secure knowing it was he who was the magician of their clan, not a man who hadn't stood in fear of his power and magic at some time in his life, and only one, Goove, who dared to think of trading places with him. Mogur alone stood between the men of the clan and the terrible unknown, and he became part of it by association. It imbued him with a subtle aura that carried over into his secular life. Even when he sat within the boundaries of his hearthstone, surrounded by his women, he was not really thought of as a man. He was more than, other than, he was Mogur. As the dread holy man fixed a baleful eye on each man in turn, there wasn't one, including Browd, who didn't squirm in the depths of his soul with the sudden realization that the woman they had condemned to die lived at his hearth. Mogur seldom brought the force of his presence to bear outside his function, but he did then. He turned last to Brun. A woman's mate has the right to speak for the life of a deformed child. I am asking you to spare the life of Ayla's son, and for his sake I am asking that her life be spared too. All the reasons Brun had so recently considered as rationale for sparing her life seemed to have far more weight now, and the arguments for her death insignificant. He almost agreed on the force of Mogur's request alone, and it attested to the strength of his own character that he did not. He was leader. He could not capitulate so easily in front of all his men, and despite a strong desire to give in to the force of the powerful man of magic, he held firm. When Mogur saw the look of firm resolution replace the moment of indecision, the magician seemed to change before Brun's eyes. The otherworldly character left him. He became a crippled old man in a bearskin cloak, standing as straight as his one good leg would hold him without his staff for support. When he spoke, it was with the common gestures punctuated with the gruff words of everyday speech. His face held a determined, yet strangely vulnerable look. Brun... Ever since Ayla was found, she has lived at my hearth. I think everyone will agree that women and children look to the men of their hearth to set the standard for men of the clan. He is their model, their example of what a man should be. I have been Ayla's example. I have set the standard in her eyes. I am deformed, Brun. Is it so strange that a woman who grew up with a deformed man as her model would find it difficult to understand a deformity in her child? I lack an eye and an arm. Half my body is shriveled and wasted. I am half a man. Yet from the beginning, Ayla has seen me as whole. Her son's body is sound. He has two eyes, two good arms, two good legs. How can she be expected to acknowledge any deformity in him? She was my responsibility to train. I must take the blame for her faults. It was I who overlooked her minor deviations from clan ways. I even convinced you to accept them, Brun. I am Mogur. You rely on me to interpret the wishes of the spirits, and you have come to rely on my judgment in other ways. I did not think we were so wrong. Sometimes it was difficult for her, but I thought she had become a good clan woman. I think now I was too lenient with her. 
I did not make her responsibilities clear. I seldom reprimanded her, and I never cuffed her. I often let her go her own way. Now she must pay for my lack. But Brun, I could not be harsher with her. I never took a mate. I could have chosen a woman, and she would have had to live with me, but I did not. Do you know why? Brun, do you know how women look at me? Do you know how women avoid me? I had the same need to relieve myself as any other man when I was young, but I learned to control it when women turned their back so they would not see me make the signal. I would not force myself, my crippled, deformed body, on a woman who shrunk from me, who turned away with disgust at the sight of me. But Ayla never turned from me. From the first, she reached out to touch me. She had no fear of me, no revulsion. She gave me her affection freely. She hugged me. Brun, how could I scold her? I have lived with this clan since my birth, but I never learned how to hunt. How can a one-armed cripple hunt? I was a burden. I was taunted. I was called woman. Now I am Morgor and no one ridicules. But no manhood ceremony was ever held for me. Brun, I am not half a man. I am no man at all. Only Ayla respected me, loved me. Not as a magician, but as a man, as a whole man. And I love her as the child of the maid I never had. Kreb shrugged off the cloak he wore to cover his lopsided, malformed, wasted body and held out the stump of an arm he always hid. Brun, this is the man Ayla saw as whole. This is the man who set her standard. This is the man she loves and compares with her son. Look at me, my brother. Did I deserve to live? Does Ayla's son deserve to live less? The clan started gathering outside the cave in the dim half-light of pre-dawn. A fine misty drizzle cast a glistening sheen on rocks and trees and collected in tiny droplets in the hair and beards of the people. Thin, wispy tendrils snaking down from fog-shrouded mountains clung to hollows, and thicker masses of the ethereal vapor obscured all but the nearest objects. The ridge to the east rose indistinctly from a nebulous sea of mist in the fading darkness, wavering vaguely just on the edge of visibility. Ayla lay awake on her furs in the darkened cave, watching Iza and Uba moving silently about the hearth, stoking coals in the fireplace and putting water on to boil for a morning tea. Her baby was beside her, making sucking noises in his sleep. She hadn't slept all night. Her first joy at seeing Iza had quickly given way to a desolate anxiety. Initial attempts at conversation broke down early, and the three females of Krebs' hearth spent the entire long day after Ayla's return within its boundary stones, communicating their despair with anguished looks. Kreb had not set foot inside his domain, but Ayla caught his eye once as he left the small adjoining cave to join the men in the meeting Brun had called. He looked away quickly from her silent appeal, but not before she had seen the look of love and pity in his soft, liquid eye. She and Isa exchanged a tremulous, knowing glance when they saw Kreb hurry into the place of the spirits after a talk with Brun held in a remote section of the cave in guarded gestures. Brun had made his decision, and Kreb went to prepare for his part in it. They did not see the magician again. 
Isa brought the young mother her tea in the familiar bone cup that had been hers for several years, then sat quietly beside her as she sipped it. Uba joined them, but she could offer no more than her presence for comfort either. Nearly everyone is out. We'd better go, Isa signaled, taking the cup from the young woman. Ayla nodded. She got up and wrapped her son in the carrying cloak then picked up her fur wrap from the bed and threw it over her shoulders. Eyes glistening with moisture that threatened to overflow, Ayla looked at Isa, then Uba, and with an aching cry reached out to both of them. All three huddled in a clinging embrace. Then, with a heavy heart and dragging step, Ayla walked out of the cave. Staring down at the ground, Seeing an occasional heel mark, the imprint of toes, the blurred outline of a foot encased in a loose leather covering, Ayla had the uncanny sensation that it was two years before and she was following Kreb out of the cave to face her doom. He should have cursed me forever that time, she thought. I must have been born to be cursed. Why else must I go through this again? This time I will go to the world of the spirits. I know a plant that will make us both go to sleep and never wake up. Not in this world. I will get it over quickly, and we'll walk in the next world together. She reached Brun, dropped to the ground, and stared at the familiar feet wrapped in muddy foot coverings. It was getting lighter. The sun would soon be up. Brun would have to hurry she thought, and felt a tap on her shoulder. Slowly, she looked up at Brun's bearded face. He began without preliminaries. Woman, you have willfully defied the customs of the clan and you must be punished, he motioned sternly. Ayla nodded. It was true. Ayla, woman of the clan, you are cursed. No one will see you. No one will hear you. You will endure the full isolation of the woman's curse. You may not go beyond the boundaries of your provider's hearth until the next moon is in the same phase as now. Ayla gazed at the stern-faced leader with astonished disbelief. The woman's curse? Not the death curse? Not utter and complete ostracism? but nominal isolation confined to Kreb's hearth. What did it matter that no one else in the clan would acknowledge her existence for an entire moon? She would still have Isa and Uba and Kreb. And afterward, she could rejoin the clan just like any other woman. But Brun was not through. As further punishment, you are forbidden to hunt, or even mention hunting, until the clan returns from the clan gathering. Until the leaves have dropped from the trees, you will have no freedom to go anywhere that is not essential. When you look for plants of healing magic, you will tell me where you are going and you will return promptly. You will always ask my permission before you leave the area of the cave. And you will show me the location of the cave where you hid. Yes, yes, of course. Anything, Ayla was nodding in agreement. She was floating on a warm cloud of euphoria. But the next words of the leader pierced her mood like an icy shaft of cold lightning, drowning her elation in a deluge of despair. There is still the problem of your deformed son who was the cause of your disobedience. You must never again try to force a man, much less a leader, against his will. No woman should ever try to force a man, Brun said, then gave a signal. Ayla clutched her infant desperately and looked in the same direction that Brun was looking. She couldn't let them take him. She couldn't. She saw Magur limping out of the cave. When she saw him throw his bearskin aside, revealing a red-stained wicker bowl held firmly between the stump of his arm and his waist, Incredulous joy flushed her face. She turned back to Brun hesitantly, 
unsure if what she thought could possibly be true. But a woman may ask, Brun finished. Mogor is waiting, Ayla. Your son must have a name if he is to be a member of the clan. Ayla scrambled to her feet and raced to the magician, taking her baby from her cloak as she dropped at his feet and holding the naked infant up to him. His first squall at being taken from his mother's warm breast and exposed to the damp, cool air was greeted by the first rays of the sun breaking over the top of the ridge, burning through the misty haze. A name. She hadn't even thought about a name. She hadn't even wondered what name Kreb would choose for her son. In formal gestures, Mogur called the spirits of the clan's totems to attend, then reached into the bowl and scooped out a dab of red paste. Dirk, he said loudly above the lusty cries of the cold and angry baby. The boy's name is Dirk. Then he drew a red line from the junction of the baby's supraorbital ridges to the tip of his smallish nose. Dirk, Ayla repeated, holding her son close to warm him. Dirk, she thought, like Dirk of the legend. Kreb knows that's always been my favorite. It was not a common clan name, and many were surprised, but perhaps the name dredged from the depths of antiquity and fraught with dubious connotations, was appropriate for a boy whose life had hung in the balance of such uncertain beginnings. Dirk, Brun said. He was the first to file past. Ayla thought she saw a glimmer of tenderness from the stern, proud leader as she looked at him in gratitude. Most of the faces were a blur seen through tear-filled eyes. As hard as she tried, she could not control them, and kept her head down in an effort to conceal her wet eyes. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it, she thought. Is it really true? You have a name, my baby? Brun accepted you, my son? I'm not dreaming? She remembered the glittering nodules of iron pyrite she had found and put in her amulet. It was a sign. Great cave lion, it was truly a sign. Of all the artifacts in her amulet, she treasured that one the most. Dirk, she heard Isa say, and looked up. The joy on the woman's face was no less than Ayla's, for all that her eyes were dry. Dirk, Uba said, and added with a quick gesture, I'm so glad. Dirk! It was said with a sneer. Ayla glanced up in time to see Browd turn away. She suddenly remembered the strange idea about the way men started babies she had had while she was hiding in the small cave, and shuddered at the thought that somehow Browd was responsible for the conception of her son. She had been too busy to notice the battle of wills between Brun and Browd. The young man was going to refuse to acknowledge the newest member of the clan and only a direct order from the leader finally forced the issue. Ayla watched him walk away from the group with clenched fists and tense shoulders. How could he? Browd walked into the woods to get away from the hated scene. How could he? He kicked a log in a vain attempt to vent his frustration, sending it rolling down a slope. How could he? He picked up a stout branch and sent it crashing into a tree. How could he? How could he? Browd's mind kept repeating the phrase as he smashed his fist again and again into a moss-covered bank. How could he let her live and accept her baby both? How could he do it? <laughs>